Coal in America has a past as dark as the rock itself. The first coal endeavor in the United States was recorded in Pennsylvania in 1754. A group of far-sighted Pennsylvanians purchased 484 square miles of land. This area, all the lands of the Lackawanna and Wyoming valleys, formed the richest coal fields ever discovered. The first domestic coal production can be found in this western area of Pennsylvania. During the Revolutionary War, armories in western Pennsylvania were using domestic sources of coal to craft weapons for the colonial army. Until this time, coal in the colonies was imported from England. From the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812, America's hunger for coal increased. In 1810 it was discovered that, when fired correctly, coal could be used to smelt iron ore. By 1840, Coal had become the exclusive fuel in many industries. Steel, transportation, and heating. All who once relied on wood and charcoal, now used only coal. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Territory from the French, coinciding closely with the formation of three new states. In 1792, Kentucky, in 1796 Tennessee and in 1803, Ohio, all received their statehood. It is during this time, the wilderness is open to exploration. Lewis and Clark, as well as Davy Crockett are some iconic explorers of the new territories. Among the many discoveries, coal was found in large quantities. This coal, from Appalachia, gave way to the western expansion that came after the Louisiana Purchase, providing the fuel and the financing for the new industries. The railroads were instrumental in the expansion process. Using coal-fired, steam locomotives, they carved their way across the country. In 1828, the first piece of rail was laid in Baltimore, Maryland. With it, the creation of the B&O Railroad, which opened for service in 1830. From 1828 to 1900 the American rail industry laid 215,000 miles of track. That's around 29 million individual pieces of track. Every one of them, created in the fires, from the coal dug out of the Appalachian Mountains. In the years leading up to the Civil War, small individual mine operations were the norm, serving local forges and the blacksmiths in the area. But most of the rich valley lands were used for agriculture needs. The riches of the mountains would go undiscovered until the Civil War. It was during this time that expeditions led to the discovery of the large untouched coal fields. The industry leaders of the time swept over the area, buying up vast swaths of virgin forests. In areas where established towns and settlements existed, the coal barons, as they came to be known, would buy out local governments. Hiring their own law enforcement, they would control the towns. One of the most famous coal barons, Samuel Dixon, opened his first mine in 1893. Located in West Virginia, he would eventually control the area surrounding the New River Coal Field. Forming the New River Coal Company, he exerted authority over his land holdings with an iron fist. In 1906 after an armed altercation with rival mine owner, Justin Collins, Dixon bought out Collins and completed his control of the New River Coal Field. It is said that Dixon had everyone on the payroll, that his towns were the definition of a company town. He owned all the stores, providing for sale only what was deemed, by him, necessary. The judge, the sheriff, and the local preacher all worked and took their lead from the coal company. The workers, lured to the coal towns with the promise of high wages, were paid in company money. Referred to as scrip, it was stamped metal, or wooden tokens none of which were precious metals like gold or silver, and most certainly held no value outside of the company's holdings. The workers, often enslaved to the company by debt, were charged for their housing and basic utilities. Workers were required to buy, or rent their tools from the mine owners. Any tools broken, and those worn out from use, were charged to the worker if they had been rented. Once a worker had their equipment, there was a lease fee for the mine, and a charge to use the equipment, hauling coal out of the mines. Company-employed waymasters were in charge of recording each worker's take. 
weighing the coal they had mined, making any deductions, and dispersing payment to the miners. The land barons that controlled this territory came from many different backgrounds, some were self-made and worked in the mines themselves. These landowners treated their workforce with compassion and mutual respect, paying fair wages in real money, opening their towns to outsiders and free trade. While others built walls, hired armed guards, prevented people from leaving and restricted new arrivals. Within certain mining communities, newcomers were frowned upon. As more and more mines became organized by the labor unions, more and harsher penalties were enforced. The coal barons in Tennessee, not wanting to comply with newly passed workers' rights legislation, effectively closed their mining operations. Shutting down production for two months, and unable to reach a deal with organizers, the mines opened back up using convict labor. These criminals, leased from the Tennessee prison system, contained coal miners arrested for phony charges. Their incarcerations, related to protests and organizing, were the judicial system's answer. Local and state politicians, owned by the coal barons, legislated in their favor. New laws were written to combat organized labor. It became a crime to speak out about poor wages, bad representation and unsafe working conditions. The coal camps and towns had become feudal systems. Coal barons had lordship over their land holdings, and the miners, their peasants. It was these repeated injustices that paved the way for organized labor around the country. The industrial tycoons, and land barons, had abused their workforce for their own gains. As the injustices piled up, workers started organizing against the coal barons and tycoons of industry. Uniting under common grievances. Railroaders, lumberjacks, and miners. All had a common interest. The betterment of their lives and their children's. Ushering in a new era for the American worker, they started advocating for eight-hour workdays, safety equipment standards, and above all, fair wages. With their profits at stake, the land barons resorted to the use of force and intimidation. Private armies were used to control mining towns and camps. Security firms and detective agencies were used to hunt down and silence organizers. The Pinkertons and the Baldwin Felts detective agencies were employed by coal, timber, and steel operators across the country. Using them to silence organizers' efforts and police work camps and their productive counterparts. Private police forces were in the mines, on the rail cars, and even at church service on Sundays. There was no escaping the hired thugs, or the effects of their enforcement of company law. Things came to a boiling point after decades of abuse. Over the years, there were countless skirmishes, gun fights, and even battles. It all started in Tennessee with the convict leasing system. The battles between coal miners and mine owners would escalate to bloodshed and be known as the Coal Creek Wars. During the years 1890 to 1893, upwards of a dozen incidents were reported. There were fights between workers and the private security agencies. Mine workers released the convicts leased to the mines and destroyed the facilities used to house inmate workers. In the most famous battle of the Coal Creek Wars, after dark on July 16, 1891, miners fired shots into the Braceville mining camp while the state's governor was there visiting. This and several other events during the Coal Wars of Tennessee, resulted in the state's militia being activated to restore order. In two separate altercations, the governor, John P. Buchanan, authorized the use of the Tennessee militia. Feelings were mixed over the miners' actions, but in 1896, after years of conflict the state ended the inmate leasing system. Not closing it down, but rather opening state-owned mines, and employing the inmates themselves. In this way the inmate workforce did not compete with private labor. Then in Pennsylvania, there was the coal strike of 1902. In the five years leading up to 1902, the United Mine Workers of America, made significant gains toward organizing their labor organizing and winning small strikes all across the Rust Belt and the coal fields. Amassing strength in their numbers, the UMWA had increased their membership to over 100,000 by 1900. In 1902, at the time of the anthracite coal strike, 150,000 coal miners were threatening to strike. 
They wanted higher wages and a set schedule for their work day. It was normal prior to 1900 for a miner to work 10 to 16 hours every day. The strike started on May 12th of 02 and lasted for five months. Ending on October 23rd, 1902. During those five months, tensions were on the rise. With the fear of violence breaking out between miners and strike breakers, hired guns, local police and the National Guard. President Theodore Roosevelt requested that Carol D. Wright, the Commissioner of Labor, investigate the strike. On October 3rd, Roosevelt met with mine owners and union representatives. A 10% increase in wages and no more than 9 hours of work a day were agreed upon. On October 23rd after five months of closure, the Pennsylvania mines started to operate again. The strike in Pennsylvania was the first time the federal government intervened in a labor dispute. As some states embraced the union, seeing that collective bargaining was the best way to reconcile grievances, other states were not so quick to adopt. With their government still in bed with the industry, reliant on donations from big industry. More strikes and battles would continue. In 1912 in West Virginia, workers at the Cabin Creek Mine and the Paint Creek Mine went on strike, effectively closing their mines to operation. The mine owners, refusing to cede to the miners, instead hired Baldwin Feltz detectives. The detectives were brought in to intimidate the miners. Standing watch over the mines and camps, equipped with machine guns, they struck fear into the miners. The mine owners using this fear took to strike breaking evicting miners' families and forcing them off the land. On September 2, 1912, after learning about an uprising, Governor William E. Glasscock declared martial law. Learning that 6,000 armed coal miners were headed to a local mine to settle disputes, the governor dispatched the state's militia. In all, over 3,000 weapons were seized, with over 200,000 rounds of ammo. Eight years later, the Battle of Matawan happened. On May 19, 1920, detectives from Baldwin Feltz Agency descended on the town of Matawan. Their intent, to evict local union workers living on the outskirts of town. After completing their task, and headed back to catch a train out of town, they were met by pro-union county sheriff, Sid Hatfield. Hatfield had a warrant for the company-owned detectives. The detectives started to resist only to discover they had been surrounded by armed miners. A gunfight broke out and the National Guard was again activated to restore peace. Peace was restored and the coal companies went back to business as usual, then in August of 1921, the miners had had enough. The final battle of the West Virginia Coal Wars and the most famous of all the mine wars, is the Battle of Blair Mountain. Starting on August 20, 13,000 disgruntled miners had assembled, marching south toward Logan County. Following a small skirmish on August 25, President Warren G. Harding threatened to send in federal troops. The miners and local officials met in the town of Madison. Agreeing to disband, the miners turned around and started on their way back to their home. Don Schaffen, the sheriff in Logan County, could not let the miners off. Having assembled his private army of almost 3,000 men, he took it upon himself to attack miners, sparking off a series of gun battles that would end at Blair Mountain. The miners, hearing news of the attacks turned around and started back towards Logan County. On August 29 the miners descended on Blair Mountain, the last obstacle on their way to Logan County. The next day, the governor activated the National Guard to restore peace. The battle and small gun fights would last for five days. At least 30 were dead on Chafin's side and over 100 miners were dead or severely wounded. Federal troops arrived on September 2 and the fighting quickly ended. The last battles of the Coal Wars came in Kentucky. From 1931 to 1939 in Harlan County, Kentucky, the most brutal tactics of the Coal Wars were employed. Company hired detectives and strike breakers went to new lows. Bombing schools and churches that had pro-union stances, laying in ambush for union organizers and sabotaging mine structures to cause accidents. It was these attacks on the miners and their families, as well as the support from local and state governments for mine operators, that sent the miners over the edge. 
From 1931 to 1939, federal troops and the state's militia were deployed over a dozen times to quell uprisings between company strike breakers and miners on strike. During these times, the local sheriff, aided by federal troops deployed tear gas and mustard gas to disperse protesting miners. On May 27, 1935 the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to force a business or company to unionize, citing codes of fair competitiveness. They stated the new code section of the National Recovery Act were unconstitutional, denying the industrial tycoons their ability to be competitive, while still recording record profits for shareholders. This was a direct blow to the unions of Harlan County and their memberships plummeted. The time period between 1931 and 1935 were the most turbulent. Federal troops occupied Harlan County three times in 1935 alone. At the close of the 1930s, Harlan County had found peace. In 1935 the Wagner Act was passed giving unions power in the workforce. While still maintaining amnesty from unionization, mine owners could no longer discriminate against persons affiliated with the unions. It's been over 100 years since the first coal war started in Pennsylvania. Miners across the country are still fighting injustices. If it's not the mine owners wanting to increase profits, it's the government wanting to overstep their role in coal. Coal has been an instrumental resource to the growth of our nation. We owe thanks to every man that ever went into the pits of black hell. The classic mine shaft has fallen out of favor, and new open pit mines are used. Stripping the layers off the mountains, there is no more mine shafts. Although some do exist, they are mostly older and falling out of favor. These new open pit mines, starting in the 1970s, bring the new era of fighting to the mountain mining pioneers. It is now the environmentalist versus the miners. Who will win is anyone's guess. I'm rooting for the miners. Until next time. Enjoy your fun facts. Oh, and thank a miner. They deserve more credit than they receive.